Hello. Thank you for your interest in the Institute of Welsh Affairs work on renewable energy and our latest report, Renewing the Focus, Re-Energising Wales Two Years On. This event took place on 23rd November as part of the COP Cymru Fringe Programme of Events. I'm Will Henson, Policy and External Affairs Manager at the IWA. I'd like to thank Friends Provident Foundation and the additional support provided by RWE Generation UK in producing Renewing the Focus. The IWA has a long history of research and advocacy in renewables, with the extensive project Re-Energising Wales running up until 2019. At the, at the inception, our vision of a Wales powered exclusively through renewable energy in 2035 was considered unachievable, but we are pleased that it has now become an accepted reality within Wales's plans to become carbon neutral by 2050. I'm joined at this event by Hugh Lloyd, a co-author of the report, along with Andy Regan. The presentation and Q&A with you all are pre-recorded, followed by a live Q&A with the audience on the day. I hope you enjoy this recording and please visit our website for more information on our work. Hello everyone, thank you for the opportunity uh, to talk about the revisiting uh, report that recently published, uh, looking again at the re-energising Wales programme of work the IWA carried out between 2016 and 2019. That work was prompted by uh, work in 2015 that suggested Wales needed an economic strategy and that there were potentially a few ways of uh, focusing that strategy, one of which would be uh, the future of renewables and how energy plays its part in the Welsh economy. So that prompted this idea of could we come up with a plan to meet Welsh energy demand from 100% renewable energy by 2035. That led to a final report published in March 2019, launched by Mark Drakeford, the First Minister, uh, which captured the high level top 10 recommendations that would contribute to such a 100% renewable plan, recognising uh, quite a lot of work had gone on in the three years before, uh, something like nine reports, a number of briefing papers, as well as stakeholder engagement, and a, quite a wide-ranging uh, steering group covering all of the sectors uh, that might be relevant to that energy future. In that report, we highlighted 10 recommendations. Uh, here are the first five, looking to have a stimulus uh, that would give an economic boost focused on that renewable opportunity but also bearing in mind that Brexit uh, had the potential to have an econ economic impact, which this could help address. Looking at homes and how we could improve those we have and raise the standards of those we would build going forward. Ensuring that benefits were increasingly captured in and for uh, the people and communities of Wales, both by the nature of ownership and how land is used and made available and focusing on the capability and capacity we might have to ensure that we could seize all the opportunities that came Wales's way. Uh, the second group uh, cover some of the elements of uh, perhaps priority and opportunity. Clearly, we need to make sure that the distribution and electricity grid that serves Wales is fit for this future opportunity, uh, not least because renewable energy uh, comes in many forms and is perhaps ubiquitous in the way that the old energy system wasn't. Uh, while some of these recommendations are focused on the work of the public sector and the Welsh Government and local government, uh, there is a role to support, encourage and make the most of the contributions that business, uh, local organisations and civic society might make. So how can we support them uh, to take them on the journey and uh, show how their innovations can contribute? Recommendations eight and nine were part of looking at the, the sort of unique selling product uh, propositions for Wales. How could we take opportunities that are particular Welsh um, essence? Uh, so the marine energy opportunities and the opportunity of bioenergy had come through our work as being particular opportunities Wales should focus on making the most of. While finally, we have to recognize that uh, transport is as much a part of the infrastructure of the economy and life as is energy, 
uh, and it's a significant contributor to emissions. So how might we focus on making sure uh, transport was successfully decarbonized with renewables in mind? So those were the 10 highest level recommendations that we made at the time. Since then, uh, we've engaged with Welsh government, Welsh stakeholders, and more recently conducted a series of interviews with people to just get a sense of how well Wales is progressing on these recommendations and what else might need to be done since March 2019. The first thing, of course, is to recognise a lot has changed since then. It was only a few months after the launch that the 80% target uh, that then existed became the net zero uh, commitment um, that all of the governments of the UK have signed up to. Uh, clearly, we've lived through almost two years of a pandemic and the consequences of understanding what that might mean for how things get done, uh, including the, the role of the state. Uh, we've seen in public uh, assessments, uh, polling and other things that the public and business all really starting to understand that net zero and climate change are a thing, uh, wanting action, yet also asking for support and direction. How can we make the most of those things? We've seen strategies, both from the Welsh Government and the UK Government, uh, that will help deliver against many of these elements, although not all. Uh, we've also seen new entities, organisations or governance structures coming to being, and particularly in Wales, we've seen the creation of the Climate Change Ministry and the growth deals for the four uh, regions of Wales. And then, uh, as a subset of that sort of vehicles, there's tools and techniques that are helping us understand what's possible and how we might uh, plan and deliver against those opportunities. And of course, uh, we've just seen uh, the UK hosting COP26 in Glasgow, something that's given people uh, an opportunity to focus on what can be done, what needs to be done, and everybody's role in doing that, whether it's your personal home role, your day job, uh, your community, uh, and how the public sector responds to those things. All of those things are much more high profile than they might have been 6, 12, 18 months ago. It's fair to recognise that if we were looking at our work now, uh, we might well also have some observations and reflections on what we said. Uh, I think it's clear that our ambition was, was at the time bold, but we also started to understand that we could perhaps have said more on, on the doing of the, you know, achieving that ambition. So the tools, the capabilities. Uh, we could also have been perhaps clearer or more robust about the economic framing. Uh, this is not just a plan for renewables, it's a plan for an economic strategy using renewables as a way to benefit, benefit Wales, the Welsh economy, Welsh businesses, Welsh communities. Part of that is clearly built on skills, uh, the capabilities of individuals in the workforce and the businesses that they might be working in or the local authorities they're working in. And perhaps we might have called our plan slightly, something slightly different uh, to really emphasize that this is an economic proposition that we've been talking about. <clears throat> so interviewing a number of people, uh, over a dozen, uh, as well as round tables and engagement with officials and uh, some of the people working in, in, this, in the public system to deliver against renewables. Uh, we found most of them understood and appreciated there'd been good progress since 2019 on transport and marine recommendations. There'd been some progress on the land and ownership questions and planning as part of that in the, the wider context. Uh, and clearly early steps had been made on grid and new homes. Uh, we felt all of the recommendations are still valid, uh, yet clearly a lot more needs to be done if we're going to make the most of both the opportunities and give Wales the economic benefits that such a strategy could bring. Uh, and in highlight in purple there, some of the elements of further activity suggested by our interviewees and contributors. Of course, uh, we need to think about some of the detail about where we go from here. Those recommendations are still valid, but they may not be the whole answer to the question. Uh, and one of the things that uh, certainly becomes apparent is that net zero has helped because moving from 80% to 100% means everybody's got a job to do. You can't be a part of the 20% anymore. Uh, yet 
net zero can present a whole wall of things that might need attention. How do we determine the best way and the best order of addressing and taking up those things? Uh, because we can't do everything in, in, in the moment. And of course, uh, we do have at least 20 years to do some of these things. So let's think about the plan and the practical sort of deployment of it. Let's understand what it means for Wales. It can't just be a sort of subdivision of the UK ambition or the UK strategy. Uh, Welsh government has this opportunity to set out a Welsh, uh, Welsh approach to this opportunity. <clears throat> so understanding how that might play out, the sort of mission that might sit behind that is an important next step. We talked about uh, the context for what Wales is doing. <clears throat> uh, one part of it as a very sort of deliberate part of an economic strategy is to understand how we grow the firms that might make the most of these opportunities and then employ the people uh, that are the skilled workforce of Wales, uh, as well as helping some parts of that workforce transition from fossil fuel work to clean and green work. And understanding you know, the targets that Wales, Welsh government had set in 2017 for a local ownership and a degree, a high degree of equivalent energy generation, how we might move them on because net zero uh, both sets an ambition and gives us an opportunity to deliver against them. Uh, one of the things that uh, emerged from a number of the contributions was this idea that uh, we need to help under people understand this, this is an economic proposition, partly by linking it to any number of ways of looking at the new economy. <clears throat> I've listed here, uh, different versions of those economic frameworks that people might talk about or describe as being how we might move forward. Uh, some of them you'll be familiar with, some of them are perhaps UK ambition to levelling up uh, with the current government, uh, some of them are perhaps global propositions, a circular economy and how we help resource flows uh, so that there's zero waste. It's important that we think about those. It is also <clears throat> important not to unduly attach ourselves to just one model or theory, uh, because sometimes these can be fashionable uh, and we wouldn't want to get caught out by that. So just thinking through uh, the economic model is important because it helps flush out the practical uh, actions that we might need to take uh, without being unduly tied to one. Uh, that was a, a clear message from our contributors. There's also uh, some <clears throat> observations to be made about the nature of the infrastructures of Wales, uh, some soft, some hard, that support this transition to 100% renewables. That's good, a good and important part of the Welsh economy. <clears throat> some of that is about managing demand for energy. Uh, it's easier to get to 100% of something if, if the total you're trying to achieve is a lower number. Uh, and it's probably fair to say that <clears throat> many of the technologies we're talking about are much more efficient than fossil fuel uh, uses. Uh, there's less um, waste uh, and less surplus energy or in ineffective energy generated. For example, the heat that a car engine generates, you wouldn't get that with an electric vehicle. It's clear that uh, renewables are ubiquitous and different technologies can capture renewables in different environments or different settings. Uh, and that might reinforce the place-based nature of this opportunity, uh, which also means that every community uh, has something that it could work towards as part of that renewables transition. That also relates to the nature of anchoring and how different organisations and entities in communities, some of them in the public uh, service, such as the health service, uh, can be part of a local system that is supporting energy use and making sure the flexibility that comes with a smarter digital system can be taken fully advantage of. Uh, it also allows the sort of exchange between that peer-to-peer uh, -peer trading and things like that offer, again, helping keep some of the wealth that's generated uh, very particularly in the local community. The final thought uh, that came through in many of our contributors' view was that sense of really pushing further and harder on the unique selling propositions that Wales has. We've touched on marine and bioenergy as being two of the recommendations we'd made. Uh, we'd had a recommendation about homes and energy efficiency of buildings, 
uh, you can see across Wales many more projects now that are taking that further. And the homes as power stations, the HAPS idea, uh, is gaining strength uh, and has delivery um, opportunities and plans in at least one of the four regions of Wales. So how can we support those things? While not forgetting uh, something that we perhaps underplayed at the time, uh, the importance of giving people the skills to be the workforce of this future. We will all be driving EVs. That's probably a slightly different set of skills for a mechanic than somebody who drives a petrol engine car. How can we build those skills now to make sure we take that opportunity and employ people in what can be quite productive and well-paid work? We also looked at some of the renewables and challenges that came out uh, from our uh, contributors, because clearly uh, opportunities have to be seized. And sometimes it's a question of putting in the right uh, capabilities, resources uh, to make the most of them. Uh, the origin of the work in 2015 perhaps reinforces or reinforced the need for an economic strategy based around energy that Wales may have lacked, or at least in comparison to Scotland, may not have had a stronger view of the economic benefits of an energy strategy. Uh, we talked in our original report about the need for operational capacity. There are quite a few domains in which Wales uh, just needs a bit more uh, people on the ground, people in official roles, opportunities to uh, be around the table when conversations about renewables and their deployment are made and whether that's in Wales or in, in the UK uh, government and civil service settings. How can you build that capability uh, to benefit Wales and its, its economy? Uh, and those things have led to a, a lower priority for some of this opportunity, which we think has changed, not least because of the creation of the climate uh, change ministry. So how now can we make sure that they have the capabilities uh, and not just them, how the growth deals, local authorities have the capabilities, how the energy service has the capabilities uh, to take these up. And while we're thinking about what we're taking up, it's important to recognize that renewable energy is different uh, perhaps to the history, history of uh, power stations, whether they're coal and oil or gas fueled. Um, you can have renewable energy capability on your house or your office. You can have it at the coast, you can have it at the hilltop. There's a lot more opportunity out there of a greater variety. So the capability and the capacity you need is somewhat different to a system that we're moving away from where it's a few power stations connected up to homes by in effect a sort of passive system of supply. A lot more potential, but therefore a lot more capability required. So that led us to uh, perhaps three things, really. Uh, we stick by the 10 recommendations we made in 2019. Uh, we add recommendations or revise recommendations to really make the most of the USPs. And perhaps being clearer that it's not just marine, it's not just um, bioenergy, but it's also uh, buildings as power stations and the supply chains that contribute to them. If there's going to be marine energy in the Celtic Sea, then that part of the answer to that is in the ports of Wales and making sure that they're capable, employing people with the right skills uh, and having that opportunity to retain wealth and opportunity uh, across the Welsh economy. <clears throat> so there's also a skills question in there and making sure that uh, the Welsh workforce is ready to do this work uh, and to take the opportunity uh, to benefit themselves and their communities. And then the other recommendation that emerged more strongly in this round of interrogation was the idea that Wales, partly because of this work on the supply chain and these USPs, should create some sort of sovereign economic fund as a way of capturing the benefits of you know, the Welsh investment, uh, the Welsh government activity, the regional activity, uh, in a more explicit way for their communities and for Wales. And one example would be the Shetland example, where the uh, Zetland County Council Act of 1974, we think, uh, in, a, in effect allowed uh, that community to benefit from the new port serving offshore oil and gas at Solemn Bay. So all of these things build to a stronger, more immediate and perhaps more urgent opportunity to make renewables the bedrock of the Welsh economy. And that's what we'd like to talk to you about now.
it's something that we can all help make happen. Thank you for the moment to present, present this. Uh, look forward to speaking to you. So we, we've got a plan in Wales now through to um, reaching net zero by 2050. We've got our carbon budget too, up until 2026. Obviously, well, there's a lot of concern around how we make sure this is just, just a transition and that the, um, the impact of this is, is shared across society. So obviously some areas of the transition will be uh, led by regulation. So we already heard about the ban on, on petrol and diesel cars, for example. Um, but it could be, it could well be that when we reach that stage, electric cars are still more expensive than their petrol and diesel counterparts. So I guess the question is, how do we make sure that the impact at that point, um, when it comes in, doesn't fall on the, the, the poorest in society? Thank you. Uh, I think it's worth reinforcing the, the just transition element uh, in the sense that this is an enforced change. Uh, so that's why government has a role in balancing you know, where the burdens might fall. Uh, if it were just a case of sooner or later you'll need a new car or sooner or later you'll need a new heating system, you could imagine I mean, there's still a role for government because some people uh, can't afford these things but need them. Uh, some people might be disadvantaged by market forces that don't work for the many. Uh, but the enforced nature of addressing climate change really does mean the government has a sort of particular role. The, I think that there's two elements that I would sort of pick up from the work. One is um, things like the Sovereign Wealth Fund are there to capture some of the early gains that might fall to certain parties over many parties and to share them out. Um, there's a terrible example at the moment, uh, in a way, um, so we'll all have read about the, the terrible fire and uh, horrific experience of Grenville Tower, and what sort of, you know, you could sort of see may have happened is lower cost materials or greater profits, use certain materials has sort of come, happened here, and now I see uh, just recently Michael Gove is starting to say, well, maybe there needs to be a surcharge or a tax on the providers of these things in general to pay for um, all the tower blocks that now need um, refurbishment. And you think, oh, okay, well, we didn't get it right in the first place, but you could see there's a circuit, it's a version of a circular economy. Um, those who unduly benefited perhaps, or particularly benefited, doesn't even have to be unduly, but particularly benefit, are contributing back in so that there's a, there's a more appropriate level playing field. So the, the sovereign fund might be a useful part of that. Um, I think the other thing is then uh, how do different sort of parts of the community, different parts of um, civic society benefit or not from intervention? So if you take the uh, electric car as one example, most people don't actually buy new cars. Some people buy new cars, lots of people buy secondhand cars, some people don't buy cars at all. One of the bits of thinking that is probably required is to think through how you stimulate the first part of the EV secondhand car market. Because if you know these, these products are more reliable potentially, they've got fewer moving parts, they're more expensive, people might hold on to them for longer because of depreciation, there might be supply limitations because everybody's going to want an electric car or and or that's the only game in town. So it might be in a few years time, rather than the scrappage scheme that takes out fossil fuel things, you need some sort of incentive to encourage people to move on. I don't know what that would look like because I haven't thought about it very much, but you could see in the flow that that would be a sensible thing to do. Um, the skills side of things, um, that probably even says my last and third part of the answer. Uh, when you're going to have a program of uh, transition, like uh, moving houses from fossil fuel heating to non-fossil fuel heating. Uh, it's, it's going to happen. We've signed up to it happening. It's going to take a long time because, you know, there are hundreds of thousands of homes that will need that support and that work. Well, that's where you have to build not just a long-term programme, but also probably cross-party support for a long-term programme to give people the skills and capabilities. And I'd hope that part of it would be uh, beyond sort of party politics in the sense that you can rely on the market to perhaps deliver 
how it gets done or where it gets done or who gets it first, subject to that just transition that we've already talked about. Um, but the market doesn't always pull skills through very well. Um, and so, you know, state and other interventions to help people both, you know, the, the 17 year old of today who might be the engineer of like the late twenties, as well as the 35 year old mechanic who wants to, likes cars and works on cars, but needs to, you know, there can only be a few of them that, that are supporting the veteran vehicles in the 2040s. So I hope that helps. <clears throat> yeah, I think, I think that's a really good point. And I, I guess reflecting on that, our, our, um, our further education system and, and our higher education system is not set up at the moment to really reskill people in that you do, you do have to take quite a significant um, impact on potentially your, your, your standard of living or elsewhere um, to actually go about doing that. So I guess, um, you know, is, is that something you, you, you think there's enough focus on at the moment in terms of giving people the space and the actual financial support and the opportunity to do that? I think we have to acknowledge that we weren't very strong on skills in the first instance in the 2019 work. Uh, and you're right, it's it's probably the most important new element because it is, you know, my skills are my economic capability. So the more we can do to give more people the, the future capabilities, the better. Uh, so it's absolutely a core part. Whether there's enough going on on it, it's slightly challenging because we're at that cusp point. How do you, uh, in effect, have people who are double skilled? You want a mechanic who can do an internal combustion engine and an EV so that they get better at EVs. And eventually, when the internal combustion engine doesn't need their skills, they've still maybe got 10 years of their career left, they can then continue to do the other thing. The plumber who comes and fixes a boiler. Um, it's, it's always a, perhaps a challenge for skills deployment, not through developing them and qualifying, but then using them you need a certain amount of experience and <clears throat> continued engagement to mean I'm getting quite good at heat pumps because I've done like 35, I've done 47, I've done 200. Um, it's building that. And that requires organisation. Uh, it feels to me that the growth deals, <clears throat> because they are more place-based and perhaps more particular about their four communities or collections of communities, they might be the best route for some of this. Uh, because they've all also got uh, housing and EV transition ambitions. Yeah, and I guess, I guess, thing, sorry, sorry, I was just going to say, I guess demography plays into this as well, in that, obviously, with a, an aging population and, um, you know, changes to, to immigration as well, that the workforce itself will, 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 will almost certainly shrink over the next sort of 20 years. So in terms of that, that sort of multi-skilled and ability to, to, you know, to do, to do potentially a broader range of, 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 of work might be necessary just for that reason. Yes. I, I think that's also why you need medium to long-term programs because people can then see it's a skilled workforce thing. Um, I don't know why this popped into my head, but in one way um, you could perhaps take the very longest terms career thing, which is the military. Um, they have structures for bringing in young people and older people, um, supporting them in an employed environment. And to some extent, and this might be an interesting thing to work through, um, lots of people in the military are fully paid and trained and developed and waiting to do what they're trained to do. They may never do it. Some of the things they're trained to do, literally they only ever do in training because if they had to do them for real, it would be terrible. Uh, it's not that hard. <laughs> Sorry, is that not? It's not. That's you know, it's not that hard a comparison in the sense of we're training people to do things they won't ever do. But do we need to create almost that agency or entity that is the home for the mechanic in transition, the boiler in transition, uh, because that could be a way of supporting them and their livelihoods. Because we don't want to destroy their livelihoods, we want to transition them. Um, and to make that work. The other thing that that also reminds me, there was a fantastic letter in one of the broadsheet newspapers many, many years ago. Um, I think it was about the, uh, the Queen Mother's funeral. And it rightly observed, it was a fantastic commemoration of her life and her work, and that uh, it had gone off perfectly. And then this person said, 
something like, why aren't the railways like that? And you think, well, that's because the railways run all the time, every day. And in a sense, their practice and improvement is real in the moment. That funeral and other things like it, weddings and all the rest of it, the royal pageantry, they get practiced an awful lot of times and only have to work once. Now, skills, the ability to develop is so, sort of somewhere between those two things, but we need a more deliberate application to it uh, to make the most of it. Yeah, yeah, that's, 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 that's really interesting. So I guess um, I, I look at this as well in that uh, there's a, obviously competition at the moment between the, um, the realities of industry and the, the, the want to stop creating new problems for the future. And I think a really good example of that is, is, probably, is probably housing in that we obviously have a set of building regulations um, and they decide how you know, the, the standards that properties are built to. And the reality is we are building homes now that will need to be retrofit in 10 years time or so. Um, and, and, you know, uh, but, and, and you know, some would say, well, you, you, know, you can't apply those standards immediately because there aren't the skills or there aren't the materials or it's, you know, it, it's too disruptive to the business model. Um, which which areas do you think could really do with being tightened up in that respect um, so that we're not just still storing up problems for ourselves? Uh, it's a good point about storing up problems. Uh, homes that get built now will probably have more, more than half their life after the sort of 2050 net zero target than before it. So why would you build something that was less and less capable? Um, and maybe there's a challenge uh, both to the sector and to the politics of it. Um, there are, you know, go back to, to Grenfell. That cladding is no longer legal, even if it was legal then. Stop. It's not about your supply chain. It's about the quality of the work and the capability or the um, performance it offers. If it doesn't offer the performance that we need, then that's just the end of that game. Uh, I think the sector, well, all transitioning sectors have had some support. Some might benefit from some more support. Uh, but they shouldn't try and pretend that this isn't a journey we all have to take. And that's perhaps one of the most difficult parts of it. Um, so in a way, the most important thing is to support our politicians in giving us firm, clear deadlines for ambition. Because those that can and will and are willing can then get their proverbial together to meet those things and most businesses are pretty flexible you know, give them a bit of time um, but then we have to be much firmer with the people who don't want to no business has a right to function um, no individual has a right to an economic activity if it's not relevant appropriate to today in the future setting so maybe we need a bit more carrot and a bit more stick yeah i think uh, there's a there's a good analogy there around uh, sprinkler systems and that we're the only country in the world where uh, sprinkler systems have to be fit to domestic properties and that's a good thing obviously but you know that 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 transition happened and you know, people got on with it and they got on with fitting those sprinklers and now it's just an accepted part of it and it's not you know it's not slowed down building it's not wrecked the profit line of <clears throat> developers um, you know and this is a bit a bit of a bit wider you know it's a big a slightly bigger change to the building but I think it's um, it, it's achievable. Yes, um, I think the thing that comes comes through from various commentators, uh, and many years ago I worked on the zero carbon home definition, uh, but Lord Deben at the CCC is very clear that um, it was a mistake of the coalition to give up on that, given the work and the you know and supply chain work and you know builders adapting to it. It was also a mistake of the Brown government to put it so far away that they couldn't hold it. So you know you, you need. You need a clear sense of direction, short periods of adapt, not so short that it's like tomorrow, unless you're talking about something that is illegal and dangerous, and maybe in 10 years time, polluting the planet will be illegal and dangerous in a way that it's not at the moment, because it's clearly dangerous. Um, but you know, just enough of a clear sense of, we're setting this ambition from here to here, but we will be around to hold on to it. So don't think it will, fold away or anything so now is your 18 months opportunity to prepare yourself yeah i think i'm um, talking of the the climate change committee so obviously they they pointed out that over half of the, the the things that need to be done in wales to reach net zero are essentially 
um, governed by powers reserved to Westminster. Um, how concerned are you about how that will play out over the next kind of couple of decades? Because obviously we've made some some good progress in some of the areas that are devolved. So you transport, for example, you know, there's been some some good progress so far. Um, but obviously there is a high potential there for uh, particularly in the the, the, the the completely reserved areas for the kind of priorities of Welsh Government to not necessarily maybe receive the funding or the regulatory change that, that they need to actually happen? Yes, I think what comes through fairly clearly, I hope, in the original work, and to some extent is then revisited, uh, is that we need to do what we can with what we've got. Uh, powers may change. Uh, devolutionary settlement will change, I'm sure, uh, for all sorts of reasons that are above and beyond Wales, let alone what Wales might have as a contribution to them. Uh, that shouldn't stop us using the most of what we've got. Uh, I'm, I'm remembering many years ago I did a review or led a review of the GLA after its first five years. And one of the things that was fascinating about that, and of course its powers have grown and changed since its original creation. Its original creation was one of the longest acts of parliament, mostly to restrict it um so a reverse sort of you know reserved powers argument you might say uh yet what the mayor the original mayor's team did was really try and understand where they could use the powers they were given and then use that to the max i'm fairly comfortable saying that welsh government could do more of using their powers to the max um the changing powers the reserved nature i think they will change over time but let's just prove what we can do with what we've got some of the things that are reserved, even the CCC would probably acknowledge, would be better done in a more devolved way. They're certainly very strong on the importance of local government, for one example. So I think that environment will change, but that shouldn't stop us. We shouldn't be unduly arguing about them if it's, you know, delays action that we might take of our own. And I think the other thing we shouldn't forget is the soft power capability. Um, and whether that's of Mark Drakeford himself as First Minister or the Welsh Government, uh, we can always convene, we can always bring people together, uh, we can always work with people, and whether they are other governments, uh, other bits of governance, like, like the regions and the growth deals, the private sector and civic society, all of those things, you know, done in the proper spirit, which I'm fairly comfortable the Welsh Government would be doing, given how they've done over COVID, all of those things will uh, add more weight than the, the sum of the parts, as it were. So let's also think about what we can do on that front. There will come a time, probably in four or five years' time, when the U whichever way UK government we've got will be expecting, demanding, requiring more of Welsh, Scottish, Northern Irish governments, and we'll have to resource and support it. So if we've done as much as we can and built those networks, uh, and those relationships would be will also be in a better place to do that. Brilliant. Yeah. So I think um, you know a lot of the discourse is around this is going to cost money. Who's going to pay for it? Um, you know what what industries is this going to destroy? You know I, I think people will always focus on the negative. But I think if we flip this on its head, what do you think are the you know we, we the report obviously talks about the, the USPs of Wales in terms of what you know what what, what renewables. Um, we should be focusing on developing. What do you think? Um, what do you think Wales can get out of this in terms of what can it sell to the world? You know, how can we as a country benefit from this transition? Uh, that's an interesting. Yeah. So uh, you may be that you, you know once upon a time Wales sold fuel to the world, coal, obviously, uh, but didn't make very much money out of it in a real sense. Um, Obviously, it paid a lot of people's wages and that grew a lot of communities. And we still see lots of the artifacts and buildings that came from that uh, in our towns and cities and villages now. Um, we, we can't really sell renewable energy in quite the same way because most of it's about capturing something and other people will have the capturing opportunity. Um, but what might come from it, uh, certainly there's a lot in some of the supply chains. Uh, so how do we understand the elements that make up to that success? Uh, some of them are place and perhaps infrastructure based. So the nature of our ports, and the job they're doing uh, on the marine front. Uh, some of them are about technologies and equipment that go into things. You know, so some of the conversations about buildings as power stations, 
by players in that way. Some of them are clearly the skills and the skills both about doing the work, but also designing and inventing the solutions. You know, quite a lot of the things we talked about were to some extent, not sure invented in Wales from the first principle, but certainly adapted and deployed and became a sort of meaningful um, product or proposition because of work done in, in Welsh institutions. Uh, so all of those things are then um, maybe smallly exportable because some of it is about sharing ideas and having other people deploy them. Uh, some of it is about selling product uh, that's part of those supply chains that might make a difference to other people. All of them can be uh, perhaps better interrogated to see where that value lies and how we might support to capture it. Sort of makes you think of a, an industrial strategy because that's then a more deliberate process of doing those things. Uh, I think there's a lot of opportunity in there. Uh, one example that came up more than once in both the original work and the more recent work was the idea that, you know, we all know that our homes have to improve. They actually need to improve because they could all improve and be better quality, lower energy demand. You know, part of the problem with fuel poverty is the economic situation of the individuals or the families, but part of it is because they live in poor quality housing. Um, if we start to think about sort of moving that forward, uh, it, it's, it's almost that deliberate application to an opportunity that we're talking about. And if Wales does it slightly more quickly than Northern Ireland, Scotland or England, because it's got higher standards, better enforcement, better support for the supply chain and the skills, then there will actually come a time when the Welsh workforce and the Welsh sector, the businesses in it, are capable of taking work further afield or supporting other businesses with their, uh, their intellectual property. So again, there's a that's a slightly softer thing, but it's got value and it's worth supporting. Yeah, definitely. And I think, I think it's important to look at the benefits of, of, of this transition beyond obviously the environmental ones um you know and 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 it, i it, it's great that the report focuses on that and looks at the of ways of 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 of, of sort of socializing some of the money that's coming from um some of the early moves um i think that you know that's, that's absolutely important because i think you know there will be a lot of people that will obviously be focusing on um any immediate pain um from from doing this so, and the pain, sorry, the pain in a way is because it's a forced or enforced transition. Um, it doesn't mean all of it has to be done urgently. We've, we've talked about that. Um, it's not, well, we, we, I think we underplay or under recognize the benefits that will come. Um, most people don't really appreciate there's pollution coming from their gas boiler. Um, they don't even appreciate perhaps that when they're sitting in their car at the traffic lights and it's a fossil fueled engine, some of the fumes from that engine are seeping into the car, will damage their lungs and all sorts of other benefits. Those are the most immediate and obvious ones. Yeah, definitely. Well, well thank you so much, Huel. That's, um, that's great. So before we um, send you off into the, back into the ether, uh, I was wondering if you, any, anything else you wanted to, to add? Obviously, I've, I've, I've asked my questions, but uh, I guess it's your chance. I, I think the only thing to say is, Let's have confidence that the direction of travel is one that isn't going to change. So that means we can all start to make our own choices with that in mind. Some of them will be who we get our energy from. Uh, some of them will be what products we buy. And some of them might be what jobs we do. And perhaps what jobs our children do for those people who've got. Uh, so there's a degree of confidence I think we can have uh, and that might be strengthened by the urgency of whatever comes out of COP. It's certainly strengthened by the Welsh Government's Net Zero Plan. So start to think about which ones you want to take, because that is the other thing. Let's not be paralysed by the fact that there are so many decisions to make. But let's start making, you know, what do I need to decide next year? Well, I don't have a car. But if I did have a car, I should be thinking about, you know, the next one, because I wouldn't have a new car in the first place. Um, I do have a 15 year old gas boiler. So it's always better to buy things because you chose to than you had to because it broke. So I'm going to do a bit of research about what I should replace it with. And of course, because I work in that sector, I've got access to perhaps more information than most. But there's stuff out there that will help you make that decision. You know, people like Witch and, uh, and other advisory websites. Um, in terms of the products we buy, 
uh, even small ones you could have a think about but again don't uh don't don't distract from your day-to-day -day life by overthinking which packet of crisps to buy um but do think about if you're going to get a new gadget which one why where from um what's it run on is it efficient um all of those things can help but can also be taken in their moment Brilliant. Uh, if it's an encouragement to anything it's just to get people to look a bit further ahead in their lives about what they are going to need to do when and covid has perhaps encouraged all of us to think ahead make sure you get your mask make sure you got your sanitizer um it's a version of that but to a grander purpose you might say brilliant i've um i've done a bit of reading myself and i think uh, the best thing I've learned is is how relatively low carbon bananas are, which is great because I absolutely love them. Um, but I'll uh, I'll let you go and uh, we'll we'll move on to the Q and A. But thank you again for joining us, Hugh. Thank you. Have a good session. Take care. Hello again, everyone. Uh, thanks to Huel for spending his time before he headed off to the Hebrides. There, uh, recording his presentation, rounding up the. Uh, renewing the Focus report, which he co-authored with Andy Regan, uh, and then a brief Q&A uh, with myself. We've had some great questions in on the chat, so I'll just pop through those. And, and then if anyone else wants to um, come on camera and, and uh, pose a question or drop one in the chat, please feel free. We've got a, got a few minutes left before the end of, end of the webinar. Uh, so firstly, from a few questions from Julia, uh, talking about zero waste. Um, I, I completely agree. I think you know, we are very, very long way from zero waste as a society. I think this is one area where a significant amount of government intervention is going to be required um, to, make this, to make this happen. I think what we can reflect on is, is where that intervention has occurred. So for example, uh, obviously it's not reached zero waste, but for example, with, with plastic bags, um, this year is the 10th anniversary of uh, the plastic bag charge coming into effect in Wales. Um, and that's that's seen an 80% reduction um, in the, the issue of, of plastic bags from, from supermarkets. Um, so those those nudges, those little nudges, um, and that you know that is quite a small nudge in reality. It's not banning something, it's it's simply um, helping uh, a um, consumer make a choice. It does have an effect, but I think there, there will be significant uh, further interventions required. Um, on on tidal power, um, our, our report, um, Re-Energising Wales, so looking at how um, Wales can be powered by totally renewable energy um, by 2035, estimated that we can probably meet around about a third of our energy needs realistically from, from tidal um, wave and floating wind power. So the utilisation of our, of our seas, because that doesn't count um, sort of, you know, big offshore wind farms, things like that, that's, that's separate. Um, disappeared from those so huge you know that's a huge um, proportion of, of what we can what we can provide um so yeah tidal power hugely important um and you know the th things like uh a seven barrage for example um could provide an enormous amount of energy for both wales but also for, for the rest of great britain as well um is 2050 too late well i think that depends on your definition of too late if it's to avoid negative impacts on climate change, it already is too late. Um, I think obviously these, it, this is an iterative process. When we started work on re-energising Wales, um, sort of back uh, in sort of, uh, 2017 and earlier, the idea of Wales completely powering itself by renewable energy was seen as, as extremely ambitious. Now it's seen as accepted, uh, an accepted reality that we need to reach. Um, you know, coming then on to um, uh, a question from Gethin that's, that's related. So we've seen the, the, the Welsh Government Plaid Cymru Cooperation Agreement published, looking at whether or not, uh, whether or not we can explore um, a potential pathway to net zero by 2035. Um, so obviously it's great to see that ambition there. I think what I would say is in terms of the vision laid out in uh, re-energising Wales and renewing the focus, uh, what that aims to do is deliver renewable energy by 2035 so that would that would be part of that obviously we need to we need to uh, have a renew completely renewable energy system well ahead of any actual net zero target um particularly if it's if it's 2050 um but it, yeah, i don't think it massively affects the, the vision that that we've laid out 
I think what I would say with with discussions around bringing that target forward, and that, that would be a huge leap, we'd obviously be more than halving the time frame that we've currently set to reach net zero, is let's not lose sight of the, the objectives and the planning that's already there um, in the, the current Welsh Government carbon budget that recently came out um, with the net zero plan. Uh, we need we need to be making meaningful progress. Um, it's fine, obviously absolutely great that we're we're discussing whether we can be more ambitious, but let, let's actually continue with the actions we've 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 laid out. Um, uh, so uh, a question from from Gerald on on carbon credits. I think you know carbon credits are a great example of how we can use our natural resources as a country alongside you know our our sort of uh, our, our, uh, control of the sea and, and and all of our other potential access to renewable energy um and that it, this this isn't just about us powering whales through renewable energy it's beyond that it's about what can we export can, you know can we export skills can we export um you know even you know power into the rest of the great britain grid for example um you know inter interlinked um cables into the sea to ireland and to and to and to france you know th these are all things that that we should be we should be talking about it's not just about us um becoming um uh becoming um 100 powered within our own country um uh, i've just seen a question from from nigel um what does a sustainable lifestyle look look like um Energy supply is one part of the story, another is reducing energy demand and still require lifestyle changes. Um, so yeah, I think you know that that's absolutely right. Um, you know, and, and I think that what we've seen over the past 10, 20 years is that this process has been as slow as it has because politicians are obviously so mindful of the fact that um they we all know that. There are going to be need to be significant changes to people's lives. I think in reality, it's very, very hard to say that we can continue flying around the world, for example, um, with the kind of reckless abandon that we are now and reach net zero. I think the issue is that uh, politicians know that and they know that they need to bring their electorate on along with them on that journey. Um, so I think a lot of it's about how we how we package that um, and and how we take those 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 difficult mm -hmm. to difficult conversations in sequence um so that we don't completely lose the support of the public which is which um you know in general support for the public in terms of climate change um climate change tackling measures is is high um you know we just have to ask them but are you willing to stop flying you know that's a different question um it's how we sequence those i think um so some really good questions there. Uh, I wondered if before we wrap up, I've noticed it's uh, half past three. Um, if anyone else had any questions they'd like to, to come on and ask. Um, obviously, we're available via email, Twitter, um, all the usual channels if you want to engage with us on our, our work around renewable energy. Um, and, and if there are, aren't any further questions, I, I look forward to um, maybe meeting some of you in future and, and continuing our work. <laughs>